Jackie Sue Rawson was born in Bonterra, Missouri on December 26, 1971 and raised in St. Genevieve, Missouri. Unfortunately, she met and married James Waller, who went by Clay, sometime in the 1990s. Her parents weren't big fans of his and said that he seemed very arrogant and didn't seem to fit in with their family. However, Jackie didn't seem to care and loved him anyway, but she became more like a caretaker to Waller. While she worked full-time as a manager with Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, Waller would bounce around from job to job. He even briefly worked at the sheriff's department before being terminated. In the meanwhile, Jackie gave birth to triplets, two girls and a boy. Waller was very uninvolved with the children, leaving Jackie to basically raise them by herself. By the age of 39, Jackie was living in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where Waller was making it his mission to make her life miserable with constant emotional and physical abuse. Finally, in 2010, Jackie told Waller that she was leaving and would be taking the five-year-old triplets with her. Over the next year, Waller's threats got worse, and Jackie decided to keep a journal of those threats on her work computer. In her journal, she wrote, I told him I was going to file for divorce. He said that he had a feeling one of us would not be around to watch our kids grow up. He would also say things like, a divorce will be your death sentence. He even threatened to take the kids fishing and drown them. By mid-2011, Jackie had finally moved out with the kids and was now living at her sister Cheryl's home. On June 1st, Jackie and Waller were at the attorney's office signing papers. Afterward, she told her sister she was headed to his house to get her son. This would be the last time Cheryl ever spoke to her sister again. When Jackie failed to return, Cheryl called Waller, who claimed he didn't know where she was. She then decided to drive over to Waller's home, but stopped by the Cape Girardeau County Sheriff's Department first to tell them she was sure Waller had murdered her sister. The police, already knowing how crazy Waller was, decided to follow her to his house. However, they could not find any sign of Jackie. When questioned, he told them they had met at 11 a.m. at Walgreens, had lunch together, and then went to sign the divorce papers at 3 p.m. They had gone back to his house and argued, and then she just stormed off. However, as investigators continued looking into her whereabouts, they discovered the work journal she had been keeping, which detailed Waller's threats. They began going around and checking surveillance video from different businesses and found Waller at a car wash doing a deep clean on his boat, focusing mainly on the center area. A witness then came forward and said they saw a man that night in his boat near a sandbar called Devil's Island, which was only accessible by boat. They searched the area, but unfortunately weren't able to locate Jackie's body. While volunteers and law enforcement searched for her, Waller would taunt and laugh at them. Jackie's car was finally located, abandoned near I-55. However, her purse, cell phone, and keys were nowhere to be found. Investigators had asked Waller if they could search his property and vehicles, including Jackie's, but he quickly lawyered up and refused. After obtaining a search warrant, they found blood in his car and on the back of Jackie's car. However, the blood was determined to be from a fish. When they looked at his phone, they found a video of him putting the blood on the cars to, as he said, test the police. When investigators searched his home, they found blood spots in the hallway and noticed that the carpet had been ripped up. They eventually found the missing carpet in a crawl space. The carpet was covered in blood and forensics were able to prove it belonged to Jackie. However, they still didn't have enough evidence to arrest Waller. He continued to harass the police by driving by, flipping them off, and yelling that they would never find anything on him. In October of 2011, Cheryl got custody of the triplets, and he began threatening her life as well. He even wrote an email to her that read, You are dead. I will get you 5, 10, 25 years from now. You have it coming. He was then arrested for making online threats, to which he pleaded guilty. He was then sentenced to five years in prison. During that time, the investigation continued. However, Jackie's family was desperate to find her body and agreed to let prosecutors give Waller a light sentence in exchange for the location. Waller accepted the deal, but during his confession, he continued to tell lies. He said that Jackie wanted to have sex with him one last time after signing the papers. He said the situation escalated and Jackie threatened to never let him see the kids again. Waller said he accidentally banged his head against her nose, making her bleed. 
After that, he claims she threatened to file domestic violence charges, causing him to lose control and beat and strangle her to death. He then buried her in Illinois in a hole he had dug the day before. Clearly, he had premeditated the murder and had lured Jackie back to his house to pick up her son. On May 29, 2013, investigators followed Waller's instructions to Jackie's body at Devil's Island. He then admitted more to the actual details. He said he traveled to Illinois, dug the hole, and then went back to Missouri with the plan to murder her. When surveillance caught him, his girlfriend, and his son at Toys R Us on the day of her murder, he said she was in the trash can in the back of his truck. After that trip to the toy store, he traveled back to Illinois, where he used his boat to get back to Devil's Island and bury her in the hole. During the autopsy, it was revealed that Jackie actually suffered multiple fractures, not just one punch from Waller, as he said. Prosecutors still held their end of the bargain on the plea deal and gave him 20 years for murder. While in prison, he wrote a manuscript titled, If You Take My Kids, I'll Kill You, the public confession of Missouri's most notorious wife killer. He then teamed up with another inmate named Cedric Dean in an effort to get the manuscript published. Dean, who had gotten his life back on track and was trying to better himself, only decided to help him because Waller claimed he regretted his actions. However, when Dean found out that Waller was lying, he smuggled the manuscript out of jail to another inmate's mother. When investigators finally heard about it, they tracked Dean down and were able to obtain a copy of the manuscript. Based on the evidence in the manuscript, they determined that since Waller had crossed the state line with the intent to harm Jackie, they were able to charge him with interstate domestic violence. On December 19, 2017, he pleaded guilty to the new charges and was given another 35 years in prison to start after his 20 years are complete. Waller is currently in Missouri state custody and will be transferred to federal custody after his murder sentence. He will not be eligible for release until 2047. Jana Marie Reynolds was born in Mount Vernon, Illinois, to Robert and Jane Wellmaker on January 15, 1966. In high school, she began dating Jeff Reynolds, and the two married in 1987. In 1988, 22-year-old Jana was already a licensed practical nurse and was currently in the registered nurse program at Rand Lake College. She also worked at the Mount Vernon Good Samaritan Hospital, while Jeff worked at a Mount Vernon printing plant. On May 5th, Jeff left his home on Jones Street around 10 p.m. heading for work. He would never see his wife alive again. When he returned the next morning, he noticed that Jana's car was still in the carport. He immediately found this odd because she should have already been at her nursing class. When he entered the home, he began looking around and noticed the back door had been broken into. As he made his way to the bedroom, he shockingly found Jana's body in a pool of blood. She had sadly been stabbed to death sometime between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. Jeff was quickly ruled out because investigators were able to prove he was at work the entire time. As the investigation progressed, they began to look at a man named Albert McDaniels, who had been seen in the area on the night of the murder. McDaniels cooperated with investigators and gave them samples of his blood, pubic hair, and saliva samples. He even admitted that he was going to rob the house next door to Jana's. However, when they tested his samples against samples from the crime scene, they were negative, and McDaniel's name was pushed to the back burner. With no hardcore evidence to link anyone to the crime, her murder went unsolved for the next 13 years. In 2001, Jenna's case was reopened, her clothes were re-examined, and DNA was recovered. With the new samples, they tested McDaniel's again, but he wasn't a match. Investigators then decided to look at similar crimes in the area. On the night of October 22, 1991, Dina Dahl was alone in her trailer, lying on the couch when she heard someone forcefully push on her door. When she looked up, she saw a man inside. The man then began sexually assaulting her. After he was done, he told her if she ever told anyone or went to the police, he would kill her. She filed a police report anyway. A couple of months later, she noticed someone peeping into her window. She yelled for her husband, but by that time, the man was already gone. After calling the police, they began to patrol the area and noticed a man walking down the road. 
that man was Joe Tucker, and he explained to the officer that he was just out for a walk that night. It was cold outside, but Tucker was sweating, which the officer found strange. However, they couldn't connect him to the Peeping Tom incident. A couple of months later, Dina returned home from visiting her neighbor. After entering her trailer, she heard the front door open and yelled out, who is it, to which a man replied, it's me. She immediately knew it was her attacker from October and ran out the back door. He chased her to the road and into the neighbor's backyard and attempted to sexually assault her again. After struggling with the suspect, he fled and she called the police. Investigators, thinking this was a similar crime to Jana's, minus the murder, asked the lab to check Tucker's DNA against the evidence from Dina's sexual assault and Jana's murder. Lo and behold, he was a match in both. When investigators began to look into Tucker, they realized there was a connection between him and Jana. The two had worked together at a local Wendy's fast food restaurant in the early 80s. In 2002, they arrested Tucker for Jana's murder. Even after being told his DNA was a 1 in 17 trillion match to the DNA found at the crime scene, he still maintained his innocence. All that hair was enough root material for the lab to do DNA on you. They compared it to the DNA they found uh, on her bedding and clothes. It was a 1 in 17 trillion match. He said, man, they ain't that many people face the earth. Somebody got to be playing games, okay? Because y'all are trying to tell me that I murdered a girl that I only knew for a short period of time. I'm saying I didn't murder nobody, and I truly don't know that girl. Okay, is that your DNA at that house? It shouldn't be. No, but is it? Is it? I don't know. Joe, ain't no wiggle room in this one. None. Wouldn't me. It wouldn't me. Yeah. Okay. You won't take your chances with the jury. You're damn right, because that was not me. While in jail, he sought the help of another inmate in building a defense who had expertise in the legal system. That inmate suggested to Tucker that he document everything that happened and his involvement in the case so that they could go through it. Through multiple revisions, the document went from one page to six pages and outlined the crime in its entirety. The inmate then took the document and turned it into prosecutors, basically becoming a state witness. He testified that Tucker admitted to entering the house to rob it and sexually assault Jana. He said Tucker also confessed to the murder. That inmate said he advised Tucker to pin the crime on his friend, Albert McDaniels. McDaniels did confess to being near the house on the night of the murder, but claimed to have a poor memory and couldn't recall any of the details. However, the defense provided a statement McDaniels made in 1989 where he told a friend about his affair with Jana and suggested the best time to go to her home was between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when Jeff was at work. However, he denied that it ever happened. When Tucker took the stand, he claimed that he and Jana had a sexual relationship that began in 1983. He said that both he and McDaniels were at Jana's house on the night of the murder. Tucker said he went into Jana's room and had sex with her, and as they were finishing, McDaniels came in and demanded sex as well, but she refused, so he murdered her. Tucker said he never came forward because McDaniels had threatened him. The biggest issue with Tucker's account is that the back door of the house was broken into, which doesn't make sense if Jana had willingly let them in. In the end, Tucker was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Lori Ann Smith was born on August 26, 1968. In 1997, 28-year-old Lori was a marketing professional living on Stonewall Tail Road in Atlanta, Georgia. She also spoke several languages, loved music, especially the guitar, and was a youth counselor at Union Christian Church of College Park. She was described as an all-around good person. In college, she was an international business major and traveled all over the world, but settled back in rural Georgia to be close to her family. On May 24th, Lori called her mother at about 9 p.m. and said she was very tired from camping out the night before, so she was headed for a shower and then bed. The next morning, her parents got up and were getting ready for church and tried to call Lori, but there was no answer. 
So her father, James, went to her house, which was right in front of theirs, to wake her up for church and made a horrific discovery. He found Lori shot to death. Investigators found no sign of a forced entry or robbery. While the medical examiner determined that Lori had not been sexually assaulted, it did appear she had fought back against her attacker, which would explain the large amount of the suspect's blood found at the scene. A neighbor told detectives that at 2 a.m. on the day she was found, he heard gunshots. They also determined that the killer entered the house through the back because the front door was not used as an entrance to the house. That was a secret that only a few people would have known about, so they began looking at neighbors of Lori's, especially one in particular. However, years later, that suspect would be ruled out by DNA. Once all their leads dried up, the case would go unsolved for the next 21 years. In 2018, the DNA was sent to Parabon Nanolabs for testing and genetic genealogy. This led detectives to a possible suspect by the name of Jerry Lee. Using a warrant, they obtained the suspect's DNA, and it was a match. When Lee was identified, he was still living less than a mile away from Lori's house. He also still had the murder weapon in his home. He was then arrested and charged with murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Lee ultimately accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Her loved ones agreed to the plea deal so they wouldn't have to sit through a heart-wrenching trial. While it may not be the result they wanted, they are at least happy to have some long-awaited closure. Samuel Olson, who went by Sam, was born to parents Sarah and Dalton on May 29, 2015. His parents separated early in Sam's life, and his father began dating a woman named Teresa Balboa. Unfortunately, in January 2020, Dalton took Sam from his mother, Sarah, and refused to return him. She then began working with the court system to get him back, but this was during the COVID-19 pandemic, and things weren't moving fast. Sarah saw Sam on his birthday that year, and he said to her, I knew you would come for me. She then tried sneaking him out of the party, but Dalton jumped in front of her car, then claimed that she hit him. She was then arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Over the next year, Dalton dragged Sam from place to place, causing him to change schools multiple times. By April of 2021, Dalton still had Sam in his custody, and after going to school on the 30th, he took him to stay at his girlfriend, Teresa's apartment, off the Gulf Freeway in Webster, Texas. After that, he never returned to school. On May 10th, Sam was still in the care of Teresa at her apartment, which she shared with a man named Benjamin Rivera. Later that day, Teresa shockingly called Benjamin in a panic, saying that Sam was dead in the apartment. When Benjamin arrived home, he found Sam lying on the bed unresponsive with bruises on his body. They then placed Sam's body in the bathtub, where it remained for two whole days. Three days later, on May 13th, Benjamin went to Walmart and bought a plastic bin and duct tape. After returning to the apartment, they wrapped Sam's body in a plastic sheet and put him in the plastic bin. Nine days later, on May 29th, they took the plastic bin to a storage unit. Sarah and Dalton had a court date set for May 24th, but Dalton's attorney withdrew, citing just calls exist. On May 27th, Dalton and Teresa drove to his mother's home in southwest Houston, where they called the police at 6 p.m. and reported Sam missing. Teresa told the officer who arrived that Sarah had come by with an officer and took the child at 7 a.m., saying if she didn't turn him over, she would be charged with kidnapping. Investigators then began interviewing family members and realized there were multiple inconsistencies with Teresa's story. They also ramped up their search efforts with help from the Texas EquiSearch. Since investigators were questioning Teresa's story, they searched her apartment and had her 2012 Dodge Avenger impounded. On May 31st, Tim Miller with Texas EquiSearch said he knew Teresa was lying about the ordeal so he saw her, Dalton, and Benjamin talking to each other on the side of the apartment complex. So he confronted them and asked Dalton why he would leave his child with someone he did not even know, and he told him Teresa was responsible. Tim said that Dalton hit the ground crying and saying, but you don't understand, Sarah almost ran me over. To which Tim replied, I don't care what Sarah almost did, your son isn't almost missing. 
Immediately after that, Teresa went inside the apartment, changed clothes, and left. She then called another friend and asked him for help. So he met her at a Walmart in Cleveland, Texas, and drove her back to Webster to retrieve the plastic bin from the storage unit. They then drove to Jasper and booked a room at the Best Western Inn. At approximately 3.30 in the morning, they drug the plastic bin into room 106. After the man returned home, he called Crime Stoppers and told them where they could find Teresa and Sam. When authorities arrived, Teresa was arrested and surveillance would back up the friend's story. Sadly, Sam was so decomposed that they had to wait for the medical examiner to make the positive identification. His ultimate cause of death was blunt force trauma. It was later revealed that Teresa had lost custody of her own children two and a half years before murdering Sam. It was also revealed that Benjamin was not just her roommate, but her ex-boyfriend. The last shocker is that Dalton actually had a protective order against Teresa after she choked him in November 2020. Teresa was originally charged with tampering with evidence, but that was later upgraded to capital murder. She then admitted to striking him with a blunt object. Benjamin was also charged with tampering with evidence. As for the man who called Crime Stoppers, he was 28-year-old Dylan Ray Walker, and he was charged with tampering with intent to impair. As for where Dalton was during the month of May, I did quite a bit of digging but couldn't find an exact answer. The only thing I found was that he might have worked out of town for weeks at a time. In the end, instead of going to trial, she accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 52 years in prison but can get parole after only serving half of it. Donna Sue Hyatt was born in Carlsbad, New Mexico on August 28, 1948. Donna remained in the area and attended New Mexico State University after high school. She eventually married and had two daughters. In 1987, 38-year-old Donna was a member of the First Baptist Church and the Christian Women's Club. On July 8, at about 9.15 p.m., Donna was seen talking with an unknown man beside a bluish-green 1960s model pickup truck at a Circle K store at Guadalupe and Mermod Streets in Carlsbad. This would be the last time she was ever seen alive. A couple of hours later, her daughter Angela, along with her friend Brad Nance, entered the home and found Donna's body on her living room floor. She had been sexually assaulted, stabbed, and strangled to death. There was no sign of forced entry, and the murder weapon was never located. Also missing from the home was Donna's purse, which contained her medication. A neighbor told police that he heard what sounded like a person fleeing from the rear entrance of Donna's house on the night of the murder. At the time, police questioned about 30 to 35 suspects, but none led to her killer. In 2023, the DNA from the crime scene was sent to Othram, and an unknown male's DNA profile was created. It was then sent to their genetic genealogy team, and a lead was provided to investigators. From there, detectives were able to identify Michael Ruff Wigley as a possible suspect. In October of 1980, 19-year-old Wigley, who was a soldier at Fort Hood, was investigated for the sexual assault and murder of 18-year-old Sandra Bellman and the sexual assault of a woman in Killeen, Texas. He was only convicted for the sexual assault case and was released sometime during the 80s. He then died in a traffic accident in 1989, two years after Donna's murder. His body was then exhumed and DNA was collected. The DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene, officially solving the case 36 years later.